you want to show them off as much as possible. Three great kids at CHS. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming back again. Really appreciate it. And now we're going to have the invocation by Mr. Derek Roger, uh, Rogers of the Cowboy Church of Corsicana. Let's pray. Father, tonight as we are gathered here, Lord, I just invite you into this place tonight. I pray for those who serve on this school board, those who serve as educators in the Corsicana school systems. Father, tonight I pray that you will give them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I pray that you will give them a strong uh, conviction of biblical principles. And God, I just pray that you will help them and strengthen them as they lead Corsicana Independent School District. And Lord, I just um, I pray that you will um, help them, God, to protect the children in this community that go to these schools. I pray, Father, that you will help them to know what to allow into the education system and what to keep out of the education system. And Lord, I just pray that you'll return your blessings upon all of those who care enough about this school district to serve on this school board and to serve in the education system here. May you bless them, may you guide them, and may you keep them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank you sir. Now we're in our audience for guests, and we do have Miss Daniqua Miller. And so I have to read this. You've, you've been here before, but I have to read this, okay? All right. The CISD Board of Trustees encourages comments about the district from citizens of the district from the district employees or from members of the public. Anyone wishing to speak may do so at this time. The board asks that each participant's comments pertain to public education and be no longer than three minutes per person. The board also respectfully requests that the speaker refrain from mentioning other students or parent and staff members' names when addressing their concerns. Under the Texas Open Meetings Act, the board is not permitted to discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on the agenda for tonight's meeting. This means that the board members are unable to deliberate, ask questions, provide you with a response, or take any action relating to your comments. If, a, if an issue mentioned is listed on tonight's agenda, the board deliberation of the issue will be deferred up until the appropriate time during the meeting. In addition, the board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. Complaints brought by employees, students, or parents may be brought in accordance with our local school board policy. Each of these processes provides that if a resolution cannot be achieved administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of our district policy on public participation in meetings and filing complaints can be found on our website. If you need assistance with these policies and procedures, please call Merrill Harrison in the superintendent's office. All right, so I'm going to ask Ms. Branch for our timer for three minutes. Before you do your three minutes, I'm sorry, by the way, I'm dressed. I was cleaning out the YMCA sheet, so I just had to let that know, be, be out there. I don't normally look like this. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. My name is Daniqua Miller. I have voiced my opinion to the health coordinator on three several different occasions on this incident that I'm about to tell you about. My oldest son, he goes to the high school. I wasn't notified until almost Christmas break that he haven't been taking his ADHD medicine at 12 o'clock due to a secretary give, almost gave, giving him the wrong medicine. He, he described the medicine to me and I teach my kids at an early age what they are taking, why they are taking it for, and the side effects of it. It's, I'm, I'm in the healthcare field and a lot of people come into the ER, oh, I take a blue pill or I take a purple pill. It's a whole bunch of blue pills. So I try to teach them what are they taking their medication for. So if he didn't know that his medicine wasn't white and he would have took it, it could have been a metformin. Metformin to kids or anybody who don't take it can shut their organs down. 
that is a scare. I'm, I mean, I talked to her. She she explained to me that they only get the a secretary gets a day training on what is what. That is in the wrong hands of a person, because a person can sue the secretary, not only the school district, because they do not have no medical license to be given medicine. They already have enough on their plate by taking notes, making sure a kid is here or there. That is too much on a secretary. True enough, they might have a backup person, but it's too much on them. And I done asked some of the nurses about the situation and they said it's out of their hands. They only can do this and only can do that. This is scary. I have to tell my kid every day, okay, I have to reassure him every day that it is okay. But when he knows that the nurse is not there, he is not going in there because he almost got the wrong medicine, not once, but three times. And that is very scary. It's some districts that use CNAs and MAs, medical assistants, to be a backup person. I asked her about a backup person. She said she just hired two of them and they was out. How they gonna back up somebody and they're out already? That is not right. And if a nurse is doing hearing testing or screenings, they have to shut their clinic down to make sure they do that. It's a lot on our nurses and they need help and I'm an advocate for mines, or what if some kid who didn't know what color pill they take and they accidentally took that pill, what would have happened? We don't want to think about that what if. We need to act on it right now. Thank y'all for hearing me out. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. We appreciate that. All right, now we're in the superintendent's report. Our staff returned from winter break on January 9th and our students on the 11th. We had a wonderful break, but just before break, we also had a really exciting um, Festival of Lights parade. And I want to again thank Abby Van Locke and Scott Stevens and their families for working on our our float. Um, it was the, the theme was the Grinch, and we won first place, and so we were very proud, and we had a great time doing that. Um, when we came back, we also learned that the district is one of the top three in the state for the District of the Year Award from HEB. We're very proud of this. And last Friday, we had five judges who came and um, visited the high school and the middle school. They set the perimeters. They tell us who they like to talk to. And we just could not be prouder of our staff and our students. Um, they got to see um, some of just Corsicana's best, and they got to have a lunch in the bistro. So it was, it was a fun day, and I was very proud of everything that they saw. On Tuesday of last week, um, one of our high school seniors, Brian Zaraga, was honored during Navarro College's 10th annual Martin Luther King Day event. He won the MLK Scholarship, Essay Scholarship, and he um, let us hear part of it during the ceremony. This comes with a special scholarship from Navarro College. The Tiger Theater Company um, was on stage after the holidays. Alyssa Baines' group um, performed SpongeBob, the musical. It was wonderful. It was hilarious. And it was very well done. Um, Raislin Janeway had the lead role as SpongeBob, and he was accepted um, also. We want to congratulate him for this, into the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts after he auditioned a few days before our performances here in Corsicana. Um, we want to also acknowledge and thank Dr. Howard for our first parade of choirs in Corsicana. We had two winners in this group, which came from all over the, the Metroplex area. Um, the middle school choir won first in their division, and um, Carroll Elementary won second in the elementary division. So we want to thank her for her work on this and congratulate our choirs. And most important um, for me, January is School Board Appreciation Month. And you can see the posters around um, that the schools did. We want to thank them for their expressions of appreciation for our wonderful school board. You know, not every um, school district is fortunate to have a board that is as committed as ours. They go to hours and hours of training. They work together. 
they work hard at being a team and that's no small feat when you have a group of seven people who are fully committed to our district and to our students the way that our school board is and we just want to express our appreciation for this. Um, our theme this year is Forward Together and I think that summarizes how we're moving. We're looking at goals and objectives tonight and we're going to continue to move Corsicana forward together. So thank you so much trustees for your commitment, for your work for our students and for the hours and hours that you spend supporting our, our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now we're going to move into our action items. So first up is our annual financial report. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Pruitt. I'm an audit partner for Patello Brown and Hill. Uh, you should have two documents uh, in front of you. One is your annual financial report. The other is a letter. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is uh, briefly go over each one and answer any questions uh, that you may have. Um, in regards to the financial report, on page two, uh, you will find our independent auditor's report. That report states that the financial statements are the responsibility of the school district. <coughs> Excuse me. And our responsibility is to express an opinion on the financials. Somebody have any water? I'm sorry. Uh, you did receive a clean opinion uh, on the report, which is good. Uh, that's followed by a management discussion and analysis on page five. This part of the report is the responsibility of the finance director to put together. Um, and really I call it the cliff notes of the financials. It expands upon the financial statements and provides additional information. The financial statements are themselves being on page 11. Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, with the government-wide financial statements, this is the only time that you see these financial statements during the year. Um, the main difference between this set and the next set I'm going to point out is the inclusion of your capital assets <coughs> and your long-term debt. Uh, and that does include your net pension liability and your OPEB liability. On page 13, you will find your fund financials. This should look familiar to you. Um, the question I always get is how are we doing? Your unassigned fund balance in the general fund is a little over 19 million, um, which in relation to your expenditures is about a third of the year. So you got about four months fund balance, which is good. The uh, notes to the financials begin on page 24. Like the management discussion and analysis, they're in a written format and are designed to expand upon the financial statements. On page 46, you will find a budget for the... No, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I've been under the weather for the last, last week. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm trying to power through. The, uh, again, I had the... Fought off the flu last week. Um, this is my first day back. I apologize for the, the voice quiver. Okay. On page 46, you will find your general fund budget. Uh, you've got your original budget, your final budget, and then your actual numbers. Um, you've got a positive $600,000 variance in your revenues. And on the expenditure side, um, a little just under 900,000. So for the year, you do you were what we call in the black, about 1.5 million. So that's good. That shows conservative budgeting, and you did hit your budget. Um, there are some schedules following that in regards to uh, TEA on page 56. You will find a combining balance sheet. These are all of your real grant programs, um, funds that don't meet the criteria of being major that are found up front. Um, so if you have a special interest in any of these specific grant programs, you know, I would refer you to this part of the report. Um, 
The TEA schedules uh, follow that, and it brings us to the end of the report, which is your federal award section. The school district received more than $750,000 of federal uh, funding, so you're required to have what we call a single audit. And what that is is a process by which we go in, we identify your large grants or high-risk grants, and we perform additional test work on those above and beyond you know, what we normally would do. There are two letters that I have to issue in conjunction with that. The first one's on page 71. Uh, this is what we call a government auditing standards letter. And what it is is we're looking at your internal control over financial reporting and also compliance with various laws, grants, and regulations as it relates to the entire district as a whole. I'm happy to say that nothing came up during that uh, part of the audit that we feel could cause a material misstatement of the financial statements. What does that all mean? These are the things that you normally think of when you think of an audit. We're looking at computer passwords, controls over cash, controls over your capital assets and things like that. The second letter is very similar. It's on page 73 and that we're looking at internal controls and compliance, but this time it's with the grants that we did the additional test work on. Those grants, I believe were your ESSER grants. Yes, those COVID-19 ESSER grants um, and also your special education cluster. So those are the grants that we did the additional test work on to make sure that you were in compliance with those grant programs. Happy to say nothing that came up during that part of the audit that we feel could cause you to be uh, out of compliance with those grant programs. The um, second document is a letter um, to those charged with governance, which is yourselves. And um, there are just certain things that I have to convey to you as your auditor. I've just chosen to put them into a written format. Um, there's things about oh, difficulties that we encountered during the audit, which I'm happy to say we didn't have any disagreements with management, which we did not have any. Um, there is one thing I'd like to point out on page two on the letter uh, because it's new. On significant risk identified, you will see uh, uh, we've identified the following significant risk during our audit. And you're going to see management override of controls accuracy of foundation accrual and lease accounting. Those are things that we identified before we did your audit, not things that we came across during the audit. I just wanted to make sure that there's a big distinction between the two. I didn't want you to look at this letter and, and you know, say that you have management override of controls or uh, you know, our foundation accrual uh, was incorrect. That's not what we're saying. We're saying before the audit even starts, we have to identify risk and this is what we do. Management override is always one. Doesn't matter if it's a school district or a county or a city. So, uh, and I did, again, I just wanted to point that out to you uh, so you wouldn't be alarmed uh, when you read it or, or misinterpreted it. Uh, again, apologize for the voice a little bit. Uh, the audit went well. Um, I, clean opinions, fund balance is good, budget's good. Um, do you have any questions over either document uh, or the audit process? Anything. Good. Uh, Brian did a good job. You're in good hands. And um, we appreciate y'all giving us the opportunity to work with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I'm on the rebound. I wouldn't come if I was. Had a fever and All right, <coughs> pre-K and kindergarten 
registration timelines. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. President. Dr. Frost and distinguished members of the board. Uh, this evening I am presenting um, our 2023 pre-K and kindergarten roundup. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, this year um, we are going to, um, of course, do an in-person presentation with our parents. Um, on Tuesday, March the 28th at 5.30 p.m. until 6.30, Carroll Elementary will be doing a pre-K program information night. So that's for anyone that's interested in an incoming student enrolling into pre-K. On the same week, um, on Thursday, a few days later, we will have the special presentation at Sam Houston on the dual language pre-K program. And that has proven to be a really good way to set it up because we have general information that goes out first and then further information can then be refined on the dual language program for those who are interested in that. Um, following that, we will be then be doing um, kindergarten information and registration sessions. So all campuses on Thursday, April the 20th, and also Thursday, April 27th, will be doing a kindergarten registration night at their campuses from 5.30 to 6.30. Something we'll be doing a little different this year is through the month of May, the Carroll Early Learning staff is going to go to the elementary campuses to do a special pre-K registration date at those schools. And so that's something we've not done before, but we do feel like there's a lot of comfort going to your own home campus. And so Bowie will have an additional uh, night that they will do registration on that day, and the Carroll Early Learning staff will go to the campus on that date. We will publicize those dates, make sure that it's um, out in the um, circular areas where they do drop off and pick up. We will have quite a bit of marketing going out. Um, I'll work, Raymond and I will work closely together on that um, information that goes out. We do, of course, posters, things around town, um, laundromats, local partners down in, in our community, but then also big marketing at the campuses and the front and back areas where we do our drop off and pick up. So we are excited about those additional dates at the campuses. We feel like that will help get um, more of our enrollment up as well for pre-K. And then, of course, we continue to register all through um, spring and then into the summer as well. And so those are our timeline dates uh, for pre-K and kindergarten for next year's school. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much. You're Appreciate welcome. It. You're welcome. Right. Mr. Bullware, we have a maintenance report on Bowie. Yes, sir. Dr. Frost, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, in an effort to stay current on our facilities, Dr. Frost had asked for a kind of a current events update on our facilities. So Bowie, being the uh, last campus that there's kind of been an issue on, I'm going to give you some details as to what happened there over the break. On uh, the 26th, that Monday, uh, there was some flooding that, that went on over at uh, Bowie. There was, a, uh, there was a urinal that the handle stuck on, and I'm going to get into the details of that in just a second. Uh, long story short, though, six classrooms flooded, one book room, one data closet, one hallway. Uh, all of those were tile rooms except for the data closet, which was carpet. Um, there was no tile damage as of yet. Uh, they got to it fast, and uh, our uh, maintenance and operations team and, and Dr. Frost and a lot of teachers went in there, and uh, you'll see pictures here in a minute, and did a good job of getting the water out uh, very, very quickly so it didn't have a, a, a long opportunity to sit. The carpets did have to be cleaned uh, by a group that was brought in, but that was not... A major ordeal. Uh, the cause was uh, the handle on a urinal stuck going going into the break so water continued to run which was draining at that point in time. Uh, they're not positive yet as or they're not going to be positive but they're, they're, they're not for sure as to whether the freeze that that same week uh, caused it to back up and run over or if there was a clog or both. When they ran the snake, when they went in to, in to make the repairs, they did pop something loose in there uh, other than ice, uh, which, which cleared the clog and, and went back to draining. Uh, uh, so it was kind of a combination of all of those things that, that, uh, that made it happen. Uh, the damages were three, three teacher desks, which are, are still usable, but those desks are made of particle board which soaked up quite a bit of water into them, and at some point in time in the near future, they're, 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 they're going to start chipping out and have to be replaced. Same thing with the three bookshelves. Uh, teaching materials, including several sets of classroom books, were ruined. Uh, 
the, the paper doesn't respond well to water, uh, and several classroom rugs had, had to be replaced. Uh, Dr. Frost and uh, the CNI team did a good job of getting, getting those teachers what they needed in order to uh, start the second semester with everything, everything back to normal in those classrooms, though. Uh, repairs, three in, uh, roughly three inches of water were removed from all those areas that I'd mentioned. The, the baseboards and the AC closets were treated and uh, sprayed with a bleach-based cleaner to prevent molding. Uh, we do not think mold is going to be an issue in any of those classrooms. Those are cinder block walls in there, so the baseboards really all we're talking about. And because they removed the water and treated them as quickly as they did, we, we don't foresee any issues with that. Uh, the lines were cleared, urinal was repaired, uh, and the carpets cleaned. I tried to check on the age of the urinal, uh, just out of curiosity. It's from the original building. Um, they do still make uh, equipment that goes with those urinals, so that so that's good. But nobody could really come up with a with a with a born date of that urinal. It's, it's, it's not new. Yes, ma'am. So it's at least Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and that's really all I've got. Just want to show you a few images that Dr. Frost took pictures of on that day, the uh, the hallway and some of the classroom materials that were soaked. Uh, this is a computer lab um, that we actually got pretty pretty lucky on on what went on in there. Uh, th those tables are, are made of wood that's not particle board and they were just able to treat them. Uh, just another image there of water. There's a little bit better one of uh, tidal waves in the classrooms. And there's another one. But everybody that was on duty came in and hit it hard and got everything out. They did a good job. Anyone have any questions? What's the dollar amount? The dollar amount is less than ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand is our deductible uh, that, that Brian worked to see if we were going to hit or not. It's going to be somewhere uh, somewhere between four four thousand and forty five hundred dollars approximately. Our insurance deductible is twenty thousand. So, right. I, I it was ten. Ten. Okay. Um, I want to thank Holly too. Um, she was over there with her rubber boots on, um, going through everything. Our teachers were there. They had their families there. They were um, working hard to get the water out. We called um, Deborah Collins. She had our custodian's report. Um, we would have had a lot more damage if we hadn't had everybody um, really responding and so well. And I'm, I'm just incredibly appreciative of all the people who came over there and all the work that they did um, during, well, I, I mean, for two days it was water standing. And then after that, they continued to work. And Kim and her um, team were able to work with the teachers. They sent lists of the books that they lost in their classrooms. Um, so we're replacing the teachers' rugs in, in personal libraries. And then also we're um, making sure that they have the curriculum materials that they need because there were a lot of curriculum materials that were in that book room that were damaged and they couldn't use those anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Shade. Appreciate it. All right. We're moving into the Corsicana Education Foundation Report. Good evening. Um, I'm Candace Ingham, uh, director of the Corsicana Education Foundation. Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, I'm here to provide a brief update to the board. A look back um, at 2021-22, the foundation was finally somewhat back on track after several slow months after COVID. Uh, we got back into the year with a new teacher luncheon where we provided $8,000 in uh, new teacher mini grants. Uh, $40,000 was awarded in innovative teaching grants last year. We had our first field day honoring seniors, um, celebrating all seniors with lunch, games, and prizes. Uh, we also continued the tradition of the top 10% uh, monetary gifts, um, and we also handed out 12 TCC mini grants um, that were deserving students recommended by the CHS administration. We awarded uh, 32,000 in outstanding CISD teachers and staff at the uh, end of year award celebration. And we also provided lunch twice um, 
at each campus from not just Q, food truck. Uh, this year, moving into 2022-23, we awarded the new teacher mini grants at a luncheon at roughly $9,200. We held our annual staff drive. Oh, I'm sorry. We also provided breakfast at the convocation for all CISD faculty and staff. Uh, we also uh, started our fall staff drive um, back in October. We are currently receiving $1,535 in payroll deduction. That's a $10 a month payroll deduction from any CISD employee that decides to sign up. We will also hold Gene Days on January 31st and March 8th. And something new and exciting for CEF this year, we're going to be selling Corsicana C flags. They're the standard size flags. Uh, we'll be selling those to community members and businesses for $100 uh, to support CEF. We also were able to host our annual gala in the fall. Uh, we were back on track with that after two years, uh, long years. Um, our sponsorships and ticket sales were $4,400, I'm sorry, $44,517, I cannot read tonight, roughly $4,400, $44,000. Uh, <laughs> We made much more than that, sorry. <laughs> Auction and wish lists were at $64,000 and the gala total was roughly $110,000. Uh, this year's gala will be on October 7th at the Cook Center. Uh, there is not a theme decided yet, but there was rumor that they are um, hoping for heavy metal and big hair, so we'll see. <laughs> Spring announcements. Um, our innovative teaching grants will open on February 3rd and closing on February 24th. Grants will be awarded up to $5,000 and these are for projects designed to begin this school year. Uh, we will award the grants the first part of March and then we will host our second annual senior field day and the end of year award celebration uh, sometime the last week of school. Uh, also, campus celebrations are sometime in April. Oh, that didn't come out right. But that is just a quick overview of our board of directors. Lynette Stewart serves as our president, and Kristen Smith is our president-elect for September 2023. I don't know. Any questions? That's all. Candace, I don't have a question, but I just want to thank you and the CEF board for all that you do for Corsica and ISD. Um, the grants that you do are exciting for our teachers. They add value to our classroom and our instruction. Um, we're just so appreciative of the lunches and all the things that you do that enhance and increase morale. So we know it's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. and we don't probably say thank you often enough, but we truly do appreciate you and all the foundation members. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if it's okay, I'm going to rush to Waxahachie for a basketball game. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Candace. All right. Jared and Casey. My wife would tell you I really enjoyed having hair that night. I know. Uh, I wanted to start off the discussion of talking about where the scholarship fund is currently, where we went last, last year, some of the actions that we took 
and kind of a status report of where things stand. I know in the next few months, you're, that process just seems to cycle back pretty quickly on, on scholarships for the current senior class. And so Casey's going to go over the good news, which is the performance returns. And so I've learned to delegate some of the, the negativity towards him. And so, <laughs> but if you flip to that first page there, um, it has the ending value as of the end of September of 17.3 million. Uh, breaking down the composition of the account, uh, you see money markets and equivalents. That's uh, about 780, a little under 785,000. About 762,000 of that is liquid and readily available for any kind of future scholarships you may be paying out. Uh, I know throughout the month of January is a pretty heavy month for scholarship checks, and so today that figure is about 667000 You're still in really good shape. I think the bulk of that has been paid out. I'm sure you may have some more over the next few weeks. But looking at uh, what all took place last year, one of the beauties of, of, and I don't know that Mr. Collins could have foreseen this, is the diversity of the, co the scholarship funds income stream. It shows up every year, but in a year like last year where you have a tremendous amount of market volatility, it really registers. Last year, oil and gas prices uh, really increased from 21 to 22. We saw a 53% increase in the scholarship fund in oil and gas income uh, to the tune of about 229000 that's as high as it's been since 2015. We're still pretty far off from where it peaked in the early 2010, 2011 range. Uh, I think as we see oil prices continue to kind of hover between 70 to $90 a barrel, and I think that's a pretty stable amount for the foreseeable future, you'll see more and more production come online. And so the last six months, we've seen that figure cl climb. So. I don't have any reason to believe this current year that we're going through is going to see a drop in oil and gas income. If anything, it conti should continue to go up. Another thing that we've seen, um, you know, last year when we met, you were sitting on over $1 million in cash earning 0.03, and we had the <laughs> lengthy discussion about what could we do with that. And so little did we know interest rates would spike over 400 basis points from there. And so all of this excess cash you have, um, in addition to the 762,000, you've got about 550,000 that's invested in short-term duration securities, uh, CDs and bonds. Uh, 200,000 of that will mature this year. Another 300,000 will mature next year. And so that 762,000 is now earning over 4%, and that's paid on a monthly basis. So that really helps the scholarship as you have uh, some pretty significant needs coming up and, and when you start to do your planning just know from an income standpoint the scholarship is in great shape and so looking at the composition beyond cash about 45 percent of your portfolio is in the bond market last year was a rough year for the bond market but one of the encouraging things we've seen is we've seen an interest rate environment that we have not seen since the great financial recession we had over 15 years ago. And so as you have maturities come in from CDs and, and government bonds, we're able to take advantage of that and buy much higher yielding securities. Uh, this time last year, your average yield on your bond portfolio was about 197, which that's coming off a two year period uh, post COVID where interest rates were near zero. And then today that figures climbed to 313. And so that makes about a hundred and twenty thousand dollar difference in annual income for the scholarship. And so, with some of the stock market volatility last year, we've started to position that portfolio to really more of a balanced. Uh, over the last several years in this low rate environment, we've been about sixty forty stocks to bonds. Today, we're about fifty fifty, and I think that's a good place to be, especially with where interest rates are paying. And that's one of the, the great things of having that oil and gas is you're not so tied to what's happening, with it, what's happening with interest rates. And so you can take advantage of when the low rate environment hits, oil and gas is low, you can go heavier on that range and hopefully generate a lot of growth for the scholarship, which we've been able to do. And so looking at your equity position, 
you're just over 50% with about 46% of that in the U.S. market. And, and I think that's a good place to be. Uh, I think it is important to have some international stock market exposure, but it is has shown historically and continues to show uh, that it, it is a little more volatile. And most of your securities, as far as stocks go, are in good dividend paying uh, stocks. And so solid companies, uh, your portfolio is well diversified. One thing that we typically will look at is the S&P 500 and sector classifications and try to mimic that or stay within that range so we're not so heavily exposed in tech stocks like last year would have hurt and then in the previous few years energy stocks and so we will make changes within that and so I'm going to hand it over to Casey to give you all of the good news from last year. And there isn't much, so I'll be quick. Uh, uh, but if everyone will join me on page three, this is where your portfolio's performance is broken down on an asset class level. Um, I always like to point out this nice multi-graph on the left-hand side of the page. That graph shows your cumulative returns over the last 10 years, well, 10 and a half years technically. Um, of course, as Jared just said, your portfolio takes a core approach, which means that you have a good variety of you know, not only uh, growth assets, but value assets as well. And that really makes sense for the, the type of portfolio that we're trying to build. Uh, but looking at this graph really helps us visualize why that level of diversification is so important. Of course, you can see that in times of rapid market growth like we experienced in 2020 and 2021, uh, your portfolio tends to trail, uh, and you can see that in this graph by that moat kind of beginning to widen. Uh, whereas in times where economic conditions worsen, like we've been going through this last year, your portfolio starts to narrow that moat. And you can see that we're actually uh, right on track. Well, you can't really tell, but we're actually a pixel ahead of that gray line right there. So, uh, But the trailing return table at the bottom of page three provides another comparative look for your portfolio's performance. Of course, we don't hold any cash in the account. All that money is swept into a money market fund. Uh, where I know Jared said it was earning 0.03% last year. It's now earning 4.2% this year. And of course, as interest rates continue to increase, we expect that to go up as well. Uh, you can see that your performance was right in, line with, right in line with the benchmark for your money market funds as well. Uh, looking at your taxable bond performance, you can see a fiscal year return of negative 12.59% in comparison to the benchmark return of negative 13.01%. As Jared was saying, it's very rare to see those numbers when we're talking about fixed income investing, and yet uh, there they are. Uh, so as we had mentioned before, this rising interest rate period has been very difficult for us to navigate, and obviously that's the primary reason why taxable bond performance has been so weak. Um, however, it is a little bit overstated. You know, A portfolio of this size has the opportunity to purchase individual securities, and obviously we can hold on to those until their maturity date which means that we retain that entire principal amount. We get that back when it matures. Uh, but we also utilize an investment strategy where we ladder uh, maturity dates as well. So as interest rates continue to increase, uh, well, obviously those bonds continue to mature and then we have money or excess cash where we can go out and purchase higher coupon bonds, which certainly helps. Uh, when your portfolio where uh, really shines is in U.S. equities. So, of course, these are the stocks that we are handpicking and routinely monitor on a daily basis. Uh, for the last quarter, your portfolio had a class return of 11.82% in comparison to the benchmark return of 7.18%. And looking at your fiscal year, your portfolio returned negative 14.54% in comparison to the benchmark return of negative 19.53%. That's one of the really unique aspects of this portfolio is its resiliency. Um, of course, that's because you're a little bit more skewed towards value as opposed to growth. You can also see that we're underperforming slightly in international equities by roughly 80 basis points. Uh, we're utilizing multiple ETFs to provide adequate diversification for the account. And uh, one of those ETFs is a mon minimum volatility fund. So uh, we do expect that to outperform as you know, global economic conditions worsen as well. 
Uh, at the bottom of the table in bold, you can see that your portfolio's gross of fees return for the last quarter was 6.01% in comparison to the benchmark's return of 4.59%. And for your fiscal year, your portfolio returned negative 13.53% in comparison to the benchmark return of negative 16.15%. So now if everybody will flip with me to page five, I'm actually going to skip over the sharp ratio graph to look at the investment efficiency graph in the top right of the page. And this helps us visualize our risk and volatility levels in your portfolio, and then it associates it back with your portfolio's returns. Your portfolio is represented by that black square, whereas the benchmark portfolio is represented by the gray square. Our first priority, um, especially considering the market performance this last year, is going to be managing the portfolio's risk levels. So really, we want to be to the left of that gray square, and you can see we are there pretty comfortably. Our second priority, then, is going to be generating similar or excess returns uh, without accumulating excess risk. And again, it's really hard to tell on this graph, but we're about a pixel higher, so we're right where we need to be. And I also wanted to point out the blue multigraph labeled taxable bonds since it was the worst performing asset class for the quarter. Uh, just like we saw on page three, these graphs are showing us cumulative returns uh, for this asset class, but now it's only looking at taxable bonds. You can see there's a pretty big gap there, but that's what I'm talking about when I say it's slightly overstated. Uh, your portfolio's taxable bond performance looks like it's trailing, but as those bonds mature, uh, we get that full principal value back, so it isn't nearly as bad as that graph looks. Uh, we just hold more bonds that were purchased throughout that 2018 to present day time period. And then lastly, we also have multigraphs for U.S. and international equities. Going back about 10 and a half years, we've provided about 40% in additional cumulative returns in your U.S. equities asset class and 5% less cumulative returns in international equities. So despite last year's performance for the overall market, uh, your portfolio really has uh, fared pretty well, at least in comparison. Uh, the rest of the packet also includes a breakdown of your portfolio on a subclass level, as well as your portfolio's holdings. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel he free to really reach out. really make negative information sound, <laughs> sound appealing, doesn't he? Do you, are there any questions? I know you should have all gotten a, phys, a calendar year statement, both for the investment account and the mineral packet as well. So anytime you have any questions, please, please let us know. Brad, you look like you have a question. No, I'm <laughs> well, thank y'all. Any additional agenda items for the February 6th? Well, you know what? We're, we we're not going to do February 6th. That's right. We're going to move the next meeting to February 13th. Some of us will be at a conference that week. So we're, we're moving, we're 13th, so if anyone has any additional items to add to that here, no, then please get that to Dr. Frost by the 9th or 10th? 10th. 9th, 10th is the last day. The 9th is even better. The 9th is even better, yeah. All right. Now we move to our consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. All right. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as a, as presented. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it, and we have approved the consent agenda. We are going to go into closed session, permitted by Texas Governance Code Section 551.01. Thank you.